In the previous movie, I showed you how to animate hair uh, and the primary action. So the primary action, let's switch off the hair layers, is the body, whatever is the, the main force that's animating the, uh, the, the scene. And then we have the secondary action, which will be hair, hat, scarf, anything like that. If there was like a little mouse hanging on by the end of the, the top, top of the hair, that'd be tertiary action you could think of it like that famous example is the card scene in thief and the cobbler where zigzag you know flicks the cards they go everywhere or i saw an interview with richard williams saying there's like chains of action going down four five six layers he kind of went a bit too far with it anyway here's the scene it's rough now the problem will be tying it down right because that can be its own process so let's see how we should approach the tie down and i'm going to just start with the head layer let's tie that down first we could go directly in over the blue layer here I've already made like an effects layer which I'll switch on here and you can right click on that and go layer style and it's under color overlay you can select any color it's just like in Photoshop again uh, just to remind you we're working in Krita which is free you don't have to pay a penny for it it's a really great piece of software much better for animation than Photoshop which is also fine for some basic animation too anyway here we are so what I want to do is to make a new layer if we have a rough layer here and just so that we can kind of keep up with things let's make that blue right click that helps a little bit and then I'll make a new layer here with this little plus sign add a paint layer and we'll call that one to tie down it won't be clean up really but it'll be like a tie down like a, a much much tighter rough drawing that can then be cleaned up or even used by itself so okay uh we begin so i'm gonna zoom in use the brush tool make sure i'm in black and i'm going to use one of my brushes here they look a bit fritzy when you get down here but here we go and these are my brushes i'll leave notes below for the movies where i cover how i made my brushes there's all kinds of different brushes find one that you like I'm going to take the tie down layered opacity down a bit, or I mean the uh, the rough layer rather, and that might make the drawing process a little bit easier. So now on the tie down, one problem that you might have with this kind of animation is keeping up with this spherical form and keeping the volume as correct as possible through all these frames. So I'm going to cheat. So that's the rough that I've got here. Let's just slightly clean it up a little bit. If I type E on the keyboard, you'll see I go from brush to eraser, which is very handy. So if you see me sometimes erasing and sometimes drawing, it's because I'm just tapping the E, like here to erase and then again to draw. Slightly different behavior from other programs. I actually like it, just takes a bit of muscle memory. So if I want to flop this horizontally, Alt M, and there's a bit of a bulge here that I don't like. So I'm going to take that in. It might actually be okay with the character beneath because actually he does have this sort of thing here. But I'm just going to take it in anyway. Because I'm going to be rotating this. And I don't want it to have weird little lumps. There's still a little bit of lumpiness here. Now this is sort of a, a, a let's call it a mental defect that I have with um, some of my drawing now. It's gotten worse as I've gotten older. Don't know why. Uh, but it, I'm finding it harder and harder to draw things that I, I knew I could do when I was younger, like drawing symmetrically. I used to be able to draw like a straight on portrait and have the left side map to the right. I can't do it anymore. So some neural pathway in my head has gotten uh, a little bit messed up. But anyway, that looks reasonably round for what we're going to do here. So let's just reset this five on the keyboard, resets the rotation. Uh, Alt and M sets it back to where we were. Uh, option M on the Mac. Let's put this thing back on. So what I want to do is use this uh, basic sphere as reference volume uh, for the remaining drawings. So what I'm going to do is just copy this and actually let's make a, a little blank frame on this layer here. So this button here and you see I was made a slug here. I want to drag it to number one and always make sure that we the clip starts on one. Um, because otherwise we have a frame zero, which we don't need. Slight irritation with credit on that. The default should be one. There shouldn't be a zero unless you... The, the zero should be opt-in, put it that way. Okay, so we have our first sphere down now and I like it. So let's make a copy of this. We right-click on this and go copy keyframes. We'll go to the end, right-click and go paste keyframes. And with the move tool or move a layer tool, we can move that from here to here. Let's make sure that uh, everything is correct on number one and it's correct on number 15. You can see the frame number here. I'm going to right click and paste the keyframe on the uh, breakdown frame. Let's just drag that into the correct position and we'll just proceed. And right now I'm just going in and eyeballing it to where the, the original roughs were. Now I'm going to hide the layer beneath and play this. 
That looks pleasing enough. Now let's see if we can see this in onion skin mode. And one problem that you can see in trying to gauge this is that I'm only seeing a small number of uh, frames, right? So let's increase that under onion skin here and we can control the number that we see and the opacity. So now what I would like to do would be to go to about the middle. And now we can also see things like arcs. That's the beauty of using this kind of uh, methodology. It's like a very powerful backlight or a light table. And I want to make sure that this final one here is in fact, yep, is that one there. So I have activated uh, enough of these. Let's just click here and there. So we can see mistakes already, right? Like the this is going in a straight line when it should be a complete curve. It's looking much better going forward into the green, but that red part's kind of ugly. So now I can go in here and fix that and uh, just correct the slow in. And this could also come down a bit. And then we see our slow in here. That absolutely needs to be smooth. So and I think when we go right back to the beginning as well, let's activate a few more onion skins here. That's looking better. So let's switch onion off now and we can put the rough back on. And now we can determine, okay, we probably need to do a little bit of surgery on some of these very, very rough uh, uh, drawings that I did for really too, almost, well, too loose. Let's be honest about it, right? My choices now are I could just draw on this layer or use it as reference. So I think what I'm going to do just to keep life simple, I'm just going to draw directly onto the tie down and not use it as a reference layer because I kind of like where it is. So let's start drawing, we go back to our brush. I'm not gonna worry about these in-betweens. The drawings we focus on here are the first one, the last one, and then the breakdown. Let's clean them up first. So one thing to do would be, and you, you'll see a lot of this kind of thing on uh, old Disney, where you can see, I'm not seeing my drawing here. Uh, where is, there it is. You'll see construction lines. They'll they'll appear on some uh, Dom, early Don Bluth stuff as well on Secret of Nim, uh, where you'll see these lines sort of feathered in and construction lines. I actually like that aesthetic. I know when I worked at Bluth that uh, Don and Gary hated it. <laughs> um, didn't want to ever see it again for whatever reason. So it, by the time they were doing the movies in the late 80s, they wanted them to look nice and clean. So I, you'll see it on Thief and the Cobbler as well. Richard Williams leaves a lot of it in, especially on the brigands scene, the pirates. Uh, a lot of those were animated by an Irish animator called Paul Bulger, very talented. And um, But yes, uh, there's a lot of roughness that survived through the cleanup and Xerox process there, which I think looks really good. I like it a lot, and I'm kind of sad that we've lost a lot of that. So I don't mind if some of this bleeds through to the, uh, the final project. Kind of reminds us that we're looking at drawings. So I want to keep this reasonably simple and I like I just want to prove the process here and not get too caught up in um, in the actual drawing, but it just needs to be good enough. So I'm fighting the temptation to put in details because if you are following along, I don't want you to get um, buried under too much. But let's definitely just give like a little, maybe a little arm here. And if we feel again that the rough is just drowning out the uh, the drawing, we can peel it back a little bit. Let's go to that rough layer and take the opacity down a bit lower. Make sure we go back onto the tie down layer. So we have this one, now this one. And again, let's right click and make that gray. Right click and make that gray. Uh, that's to signify a key drawing, which will actually um, accelerate the, the process a lot. Now, one problem that I have here is I want to toggle directly between 115 and I have all these drawings in here. There's probably a way to mark things as keys. I My memory seems to tell me there is, I, but right now I'm just gonna temporarily drag 15 to here and I'll, I'll drag the reference from there to here too. And so now I can, I have, two keyboard shortcuts A and S that I've set up. Whatever shortcuts you use, you can set them under settings, configure Krita, where you can set up keyboard shortcuts. I've covered that in the previous movie, but I recommend something easy that's close to the space bar. A and S are good, Z and X will be good, Q and W, one and two on the keyboard, whatever you can get to work. So we have our construction line here for the eye line, uh, and I do want to go like this. So we're looking up at the head from this angle. Let's put the, the 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 center line on the side of the head here that the ear will be attached to. And this is in profile. So we just want to have one eye here and one eyebrow. Maybe break the line a little bit. And I want the nose to be more or less like this roundy nose. 
and let's change the, the mouth. One thing that you kind of lose when you work with puppet systems is that you unconsciously begin to stop doing things like these these big changes to the mouth shape. You kind of stop doing it and it's you, you start just using the puppet and whatever the puppet can do. And what happens, and this happened to me, uh, you just stop doing things that look nice because they're just a pain to do with a puppet system. So you begin animating to the puppet instead of animating with the puppet. So one advantage that we have when we draw by hand is the, you start getting back, uh, you can't help it, you just start getting back some of the things that you used to do and that you've forgotten. So I want the body to be kind of really tilting forward. Let's do something a little more dramatic than, than was on my original uh, rough pass. And again, this is the kind of flow with the, the character design that you tend to not see with puppets because they're puppets. And to try to do this would break the puppet many times. Or it would require a lot of shape tweening and making these little points and things. So that's one reason why a lot of animation that we see now um, tends to have that look to it. And I don't like it. Now, the reason why people do it is because it's cheap. And it's it's usually a choice between doing that or doing nothing. So people choose to, to work with the thing that is cheap. But let's not fool ourselves here, right? Like the thing that looks the best looks the best for a reason. It costs more for a reason and it's just more interesting to look at. So we kind of lost a lot of that stuff by the rush to, to work with all these puppet things. There's a separate kind of course I could do on how to try to integrate some of this with a puppet, but it does involve breaking out of the puppet into something that's more hand-drawn and then go back into the puppet. So. You can actually synthesize a lot of this with a puppet system if you are working with Animate CC or Harmony or Character Animator or one of those other, other puppet-based systems. Anyway, so now we have this to here, that to there. And I want to work with the breakdown as well. So I'm going to just, again, temporarily whoops, um, move these. This is like shuttling paper on the drawing board. Let's move these back to here. And I'll rearrange them now in a moment once I do this. So now I can toggle between number one, uh, number, I think, seven, and then number 15. And we do have the eye line going down really far on here. So let's just keep drawing that. So notice how I'm pushing the eyes down a bit further. I'm not just robotically going over the, the rough. I'm trying to improve it at every point of the process. Now these ears are starting to rotate. This one is going to go out of sight, so we're starting to see a change in the angle. And we do want to hint at the other ear coming into view. Let's switch off the reference layer so we can see this better. Let's just hint at the mouth there. Now the other thing that I can do just to break this up a little bit is let's bring up this hand. So it's almost leading the action a little bit. We don't have to do anything huge with it, but just bring it up like that. And we're going to start hinting in the, the far arm coming into view as well. My drawing drawing style is I like to work with multiple lines and build it up. It's a little, maybe a little more tentative sometimes. Occasionally then I'll just click into high gear and start doing like single lines that are a bit more confident. Uh, but either will work. I've worked with some very talented people that have worked in either. Um, so it's not like a thing that you have to follow. But if you do feel like you're more comfortable drawing light and then feathering it, in, feathering it in and then tightening it down a bit, whatever works. I'm going to erase some of these construction lines a little bit. Just leave a hint of them in. And here too, I think they're just too strong here. Whoops. Okay. So given that, uh, I think we can, it's not ideal. There's some business going on here that I don't like. Uh, let's see if I can open that space a little bit. This is another trick that you can do if you think you're getting into trouble. Um, if you open the the space between, this is an old John Palmer thing. I saw him teach at Bluth on a video sent over from LA once. Um, when you close off a shape, it flattens it. So you get a, a nicer flow, it's more realistic if things are open. This has to be sort of closed here because we're coming around the geometry of the of the face. But you'll often see people closing off shapes that don't don't need to be closed off. And I always, it tires me because when I see them do it, I kind of open it up in my head. <laughs> um, but it's just, if you're not conscious of it, you don't know. Anyway, let's zoom out and let's just put these back to where they should be. That should be on 15. Next will be to do the uh, in-betweens here and here. So again, I might need to move these around a little bit. Um, the other thing that you can do, I'm going to switch off the, the reference layer now. I don't think I need it. So I'm going to 
to a different trick here, right click, clone keyframe, and I'm going to just drop it down here and go paste keyframe. And now when I see these little jaggy lines, that means this is a clone of number one. That means any change I make to this, will now on say this drawing is now on that one too. It's the same drawing. It's like a symbol. And I'm sure you're probably used to the idea of a symbol in Animate CC or Harmony. So let's take this one here. I'm going to also make that red. That's our breakdown. I'm going to right click clone keyframe and paste keyframe. And that's now also a clone. So now I have like a little temporary work area here and I can move things around and I can rearrange drawings if I need to do to pull one out and to drop one in. Back in the day, we were always doing this with paper. You take the, if you want to just see X amount of drawings, you're taking sheets out and putting them on the table and rolling with three or four of the ones you want to focus on. So in this case, I just want to work with these. So let's right click, clone keyframe, go to here, paste keyframe. And now if I click on the first one, see the diagonals. And then this one, see the diagonals there. On this one, there they are. So I'm, I can now work with the onion skin. Let me switch the onion skin down to just this many. I do not need any more than just this few here. One, two, three. I might even switch off the one before. Let's see, one, two, three. Let's put it back on. It is showing me this drawing here is coming in, which I don't really want to be onion skin, but let's not worry about that. So now I can go in, and this is a half. So if you look at the timing chart that I had on the original roughs, we're working on, let's see, seven was the red one. I'm working on number five. So this is five. We could also put our number here if we're in danger of being confused. So the other thing that you can do when you're animating on paper is you, you're, you're a lot of toggling, a lot of doing this. So actually what I'm going to do here is just put in a blank frame and then that will help me with the onion skin. I think that will help me focus on, switch it off. And oh, uh, I think, I don't know why I'm seeing this end one here. Oh, there we go. Okay, that was the uh, the layer beneath that I don't need. So now I can really focus on, and this is a temporary blank. I'll take this out in uh, once I finish doing all the in-between. Right, so let's get the eye line moving. Now there's something else that you can do. You don't have to use onion skin as you become more proficient with this process. Always amazed me when I began doing in-betweens at Bluth in the 80s. They said some people prefer it without the backlight. I couldn't imagine it, but you get really fast with the flipping process. So you, you will hit the point sometimes where you might just find it easier to uh, switch the backlight on or off. Sometimes with a very complex drawing with a lot of like line detail, the the backlight doesn't help because there's just too much going on. There's too many lines overlapping. You can see already a simple design like this is already starting to feel a little bit overwhelming. So oftentimes you use the backlight to block in the big forms and then just use flipping because you can see more easily. So the other thing that I want to do here is to really have the eye feel like it's closing. Now the other thing that you can do, see, I'm, see where I'm hovering corner of the eye here. I'm going to put an X there and let's go to the first one and I'm going to hover there and put a, put an X there. And this allows you to see like a visual. So we, what we don't want to have happen is the eye be on a straight line. So we, we want it to be arcing. So the corner of the eye should be somewhere along this arc path. So those temporary markers will give us an idea. And of course, once you're happy with that, get rid of them. Let's do the same thing for this eye and see if I guessed right or not. So I'm going to just pick this point here and that's the point here. So I think I definitely made a mistake here. I think I could probably bring that eye down a bit more. And let's get rid of the little dots. That's a handy little trick. Don't have to use it all the time, but if you feel that, you know, something might not be working, it's a great diagnostic. So I'm starting to loosen up more than I should here. So let me just tighten down the eyebrows. Because again, this is a tie down. It's not a loose down. So I uh, need to make sure that we are actually drawing something so clean that we could either use this as the final animation if we're happy with this kind of rough style, or we can easily clean it up. So I'm going to need my onion skin back for the next part. And again, we have our point here and here. So the corner of the ear, again, should be probably arcing to somewhere like this. One, two, three. And the tip of the ear as well. You don't want that to be on a straight line because again, we are moving in a curved path. And the see how the ear here is overlapping the skull? So we can keep overlapping the skull a little bit. And just block in the, the body. Again, I'm looking at this green curve here, that red curve there. Just trying to get roughly in between the two. And let's switch off onion skin. And let's put it back on for this neck area. I don't want that to drift. Okay. Now for this hand to read like it's actually doing something that we can see, 
we do need to begin to bend it. So that corner is there, corner is about here. So let's start to bend that elbow around here. Doesn't have to be the same angle of a bend, but just teasing in. And then we can just erase back some of the crud. He's certainly feeling very blobby. Uh, I need to build out some of this cheek here. It's starting to lose form a little bit. It's very easy to happen on in-betweens. Okay, I'm not sure about that cheek. So this red line here is going into this green one. But I think it's got it's I think it's gaining a little too much volume. Let's pull it back a bit. So this corner of the mouth here is going to be important. So again, I'm going to make like a little X, little X there. So you see, I'm making a mistake here. So on the uh, in between, it's too high. So it's kind of making the face look a little weird. So that diagnoses that drawing problem. So we bring that corner down to about here and delete that, delete that. Things that tend to get forgotten a lot are these little creases. I'm going to ruin a lot of movies for you now. The next time you watch one of those high quality Disney features that were hand drawn, pay attention to these and you'll often see that they disappear because somebody lost concentration in the cleanup process. And it's always the, can be the cleanup process, but if it happens at this stage too, the rough process, then it'll definitely get, could well get passed on to the cleanup artist when they begin to really, really cleaning it up for the final phase. But you, you want to make sure that you keep on top of things like little lines, like if you have a line coming out of the ear, that either it fades out over time or it, but it doesn't just pop off for one frame. Okay, so I think that might be all right. It's not great. It is not great, but I just want to show you the, the, the process. And you see, because it's a clone, we have the clone copied to here. So I'm going to just move these apart. I'm not going to delete any of them because these are all useful clones. And as we continue to progress through and make changes, we might want to be able to go backwards and forwards and reuse them. Uh, something disappeared here. Let me undo. There we go. Um, so I want to move this this clone of number one to here. And I want to copy or clone rather this, the next number three into here paste frames and again check to make sure you, you see the little diagonals so as i click on the gray you see the diagonals here it's a clone 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 so now i, I can begin working on this guy so onion skin and we have our onion skin set to just over here to one before and after and uh, we continue so i'll probably speed this up because it gets it gets really boring um this is the, the big problem with hand-drawn animation. It's not the keys that will murder you. It's the in-betweens. And with all the hoo-ha about AI, I keep wishing... I think Linus Torvalds, the uh, Linux guy, said 90% of AI is crap. And there's actually a name for that. It's called Sturgeon's Law. 90% of everything is crap. Hopefully not this movie. Um, but that means 10% of it could be useful. And I'll tell you the 10% I would like uh, if, and no one's listening, but if they were, give me an AI that can do these in-betweens because if you wanted to bring back hand-drawn animation, uh, AI, an AI that could at least, or maybe even tight ones, like from here to here, you might have in some scenes seven or eight or nine in-betweens and it's taking you for a complex character, maybe half an hour to draw one. Imagine a computer that can do it in seconds, right? So same thing with cleanup. Um, you, you then double that for cleanup. Then you got to go in and repeat the process all over again. Imagine a, an AI that could do all those cleanup in-betweens. And that will be something that gives control to a human artist that would enable them to do something great. Because I'm telling you, the, the one thing that is murdering the e economics of hand-drawn animation is the in-betweens. And it was the grind. It was just at the Bluth studio, the fourth floor, we call it the Roman galley because it was just four seats on each side. And there were, I think, 20 rows, something like that. Uh, maybe more, hard to remember now. Um, we always make jokes about one of the supervisors having the big Roman galley drum going ramming speed. But that that's, that's what you need. You need these enormous armies of people and the economics just aren't there for that anymore. But we could still have the economics of animators and assistant animators and then use a computer to do all of what I'm doing right now. I've seen enough to know this should be done by a computer and um, it would be great if it were because it's not fun. Um, okay, so let's get the mouth in there. And now we can, we're getting close enough now that I think we can see. Oh, that face is looking so weird. Um, so something's gone haywire here. So what I'm going to do is just change this mouth. Just bring it into there and move it up. I'm going to switch off the light table because it's not helping me. Okay, so we're trying to cheat it out of this 
and I think too I'm kind of losing mass here on the jaw see what's happening here that this mass of the jaw is disappearing and it's looking very strange so what I'm going to do is make a correction to to this and I will continue with that correction here to just give it a bit more flesh and I've left the construction lines off but be about that okay let's go to the beginning and see how that feels so you see how bad those drawings are. I'm not going to like sugarcoat that. Those drawings do not look good. But watch what happens when we actually move. So the drawings that we're really going to see are the, the ones at the beginning. If, certainly if we hold on that. Once we begin to move, they kind of fly by really quick. So I just want to get these good enough. And then also use this as a demonstration of what we can get away with. Because one of my greatest kind of, I think, not failures, but issues is I, I tend to get too perfectionist about things. And if you do go frame by frame over classic Warner Brothers cartoons, Looney Tunes, Disney, just go frame by frame over any given scene. And you'll often see drawings that are weird, like very strange. So I'm just going to clone this keyframe here, paste frames. And I'm going to continue the slow in here. So this is number 7, that's 9, 11, 13, 15. I'm going to go on this one, clone keyframe, paste keyframe, and onion skin on, and then continue here. But it's very important that they, a slow in, like it starts to look kind of as close to this as possible. A slow in really needs to be tight, but because we snap out of motion here, some of these dodgy drawings, we're actually going to get away with them. So I don't think we're going to have that luxury in this green area here. So let me just continue this process, conscious of the fact that I need to like level up the <laughs> the drawing a little bit. Let's um, switch back on. I'm going to put on some of the um, these reference frames. So I'm going to right click on here. Um, we're on the rough layer. Clone keyframe, paste keyframe, clone keyframe, paste keyframe. And again, we're working on this one. Clone keyframe and paste key. So, and I'm going to switch the opacity up a little bit because it's starting to fade out a little. So now I can have a rough idea of where I had the nose before. I only need this for a very brief reference. Oh, and I'm on the rough layer, so put the tie down. And we should also be keeping the eyes closed just a little bit. I wouldn't pop them open here. It's another one of Richard Williams' tricks when changing expression. Don't, If you want the change in expression to read, don't change it in the middle of a fast head move. You won't notice it. If you want that thing to, to read, you want it to happen as the character is either stationary or slowing down. Very, very good advice. Okay, the rest of that is just rubbish. I don't need any more than that. So let's go in and lightly sketch in the forms. I think I can switch off the uh, onion back on for the ear so again the ear will be joining somewhere around here we wanted to go to there and again we want this thing to arc so the ear should join somewhere along an arc path like that be about there okay onion off now that head's looking much better than the junky ones at numbers three and five we're also going from this three quarter view into a profile view so i think on the next in between i'll start really favoring that profile view So one thing to watch out for here is this leading arm, which is going to pop off if we're not careful. Let's see if we go from there to there. It'll look like oof. So we, we still need to have that elbow moving around. I'm beginning to move down as well because we only have a small number of frames here to play with. One, two, three, four. So we do have to be conscious of the fact we don't want the, the this part, body part to do anything too drastic. You notice too, I spent a bit more time. I was actually on the phone. <laughs> Um, with this and I just had the luxury of a little more time just to put some lines down and they, they do look a lot better when you start putting uh, a few more careful lines in lots of little light strokes I think they look really nice so we possibly can get away with having uh, this hand pop around but here's a thing to remember uh, and this is one thing when we were animating by hand back in ye olden times it would be very easy to forget that these are color areas so this is going to be, say, some sort of skin color. Now imagine if I go from this to that, you're going to get a pop. And uh, not a good pop, you're going to get a bad pop where this color area just goes and disappears. We do not want that. So we need to do something that allows this color area to elegantly disappear off screen. So that the color process does kind of affect how I approach this. 
So let's do a different kind of solution here where we see a little more of the color. So maybe we can have a thumb. I don't want to really get into too much of drawing a hand, but we should certainly have this color area be maybe sideways. So it's a little smaller. So it's beginning to ease off screen. The other thing to maybe make it a little bigger here, as that will be its largest size. So this is the, uh, the thumb. Now here too, we're going to see this uh, reaction where we see the uh, the take or the the uh oh the seeing a flying saucer or whatever. So let's keep the mouth kind of we'll follow the Richard Williams advice and keep the mouth still sort of happy here. So we get to see that the mouth go from here to there. So we have a better chance of noticing that emotional transition. Great. So now we have. A lot of uh, business to go from here to here. I think that's going to look fine. Uh, let's make sure that we just tighten this drawing here a little bit. Any mistake that we make on the the first drawing that's going into the, the slow in, it'll be re replicated throughout every subsequent in between. So you really want to make sure when you do these big slow ins that you're kind of picky about the first one or two because any mistake there, you're going to regret it. It just means you're going to have to go back in and make that correction through all three, four, five, six in-betweens or however many it is. Earlier, I mentioned about keeping shapes open. Now, here's a good example. See here how this is closed off? This this sort of decision drives me crazy because all you got to do, and we can just probably do it on this drawing. We're, we're closing up that shape, but it's still open. So let me tighten this down a little bit. The other thing I might do is move this line as well, looking at it here. I think it could be a little further back. Okay, so now we have two drawings that will go between here and here that will ease us in the simplest possible um, animation on this because we could have an overshoot and a settle. And again, I didn't want to get into any of that for this first kind of example because it's just too much uh, if you if you haven't kind of done this sort of process before. Okay, so I want to make a new space here for this one. Number 11. I'm always forgetting that I'm in eraser or brush mode. It's the one one thing that kind of annoys me about it. So this is going to be a half. So the eyes are going to be about here. And actually the eye should be further over. So it should be about here with this eye maybe just starting to go over the, the edge of the skull. So the middle will be around there. And the tip of the nose will be around here. And again, this corner of the ear, we want it arcing. So oh, my, my construction line was good bottom will arc as well. Now at this point I think I'm not going to do anything too brave with the shape of the mouth. I'm just going to start in betweening into the final shape and the hand will start at this point. I think we can start. Let's, again you can see why here's where I would rather not have the onion skin on. There's, it's just too busy. I will put it on for that collar. This line here to there about here. So you'll notice too, there are all these little tiny imperfections because a hand drawn in between, like if we if we did ever have like an AI doing this, it might actually be too good. Um, having said that, I would like it. Um, but when a human does it, you see all these little things that are slightly off and the best drawn human in between will always have these. And so what you have when you use these puppet systems in Harmony or uh, Animate CC, Flash or what have you, they're so clean um, that no human could draw. I remember the first time I did like a, a, a slow in with a, a puppet character. I was just amazed by it, by, by how smooth it looked. I'd never seen anything like it. This is in the early 2000s when I was probably one of the first people to start playing with it. And after a while, you just take it for granted and it stops being it stops being interesting. And it's just, oh, yeah, that's just the way it is. But the other thing, too, because it's that perfect, it's a little synthetic it doesn't feel quite right and actually if you look at live action actors uh they're also jittery like reality isn't as smooth as cgi uh, or, or puppet systems or anything that's digitally in between so and if i did have an ai that could do these by hand i would like to add like a jitter <laughs> onto it that um you know would give like little errors so it could be perfect or 100% accuracy or 10% accuracy, I think, would be would be interesting. Something, these decisions here might be difficult for uh, an AI to come up with. Um, I would think it would be kind of tricky, but I'm going to pop the, uh, the hand around. There we go. 
So now the hand can sort of begin to pop off. And again, that color area will not disappear from this to zero. It'll it'll move from this to half that, to maybe like a little, on the next in between, I'll, I'll really start to ease it out. I want to put the, the uh, backlight on for this, this little area here. Actually, backlight off X to there. So the next corner will be here. And now when I uh, when I come out, that looks not too bad at all. So uh, I think we've just got one left, thankfully. Uh, so let's go to this one, clone and copy and onion. And when you get into the really tight stuff, you might want the onion skin to be on a lot more often because the lines, it, it really works towards the strength of a light table at this point. And future pass on this, I probably will add like one more in between, maybe two in there. Yeah, like imagine again, I'll harp on a bit. If this ear was a puppet system, this would be a symbol and you would see it moving completely into the full stop. And there wouldn't be any of these little tiny variations in my drawings that I can't avoid, but um, a computer will make it perfect. And again, that's one thing that your brain picks up on. If you're familiar with red letter media, one of their sayings is uh, you didn't notice, but your brain did. And it's one of those things that even a person who has never even used uh, animation software might pick up on. Like, I don't know what it is. I just know there's something here that's not quite right. So that's that's what you're you're finding in your head. You're, you're just noticing that um, it's too perfect. It's too clean. It lacks that certain human fallibility that makes it interesting. So one of my other big passions is fake faking things. Like I love um, pastiches, homages to uh, past uh, times. So I've done courses on rubber hose animation and 1980s style animation. And I, I love it when people do those old time projects. Um, there's a great example in From the Earth to the Moon, the Tom Hanks TV show about the Apollo moon landings. They have a whole Woody Woodpecker cartoon in it where Woody is, uh, it's an educational cartoon where Woody shows people how NASA's going to the moon. And the first time I saw that thing, I thought it was... Um, period and I only found that afterwards it was two guys on you did it uh Dave Spafford and uh Shane Zalton and well, they did a great job like it's just beautifully done it's very hard to pull that off and I know Dave wasn't happy with it but he's not he's never happy with anything anyone who knows him so um no it was it was superb I thought so um, vast majority of people that would look at that would never have any idea so that's the kind of for me the gold standard of being able to not just copy the the style of a, an earlier period period but usually the the technology why did they do it like that and uh, there's usually like a, a, a technological reason for things looking the way they did it wasn't just a random aesthetic often it's not a random aesthetic so when you look at jungle book hunted and one dalmatians in the 1960s it was because the xerox machines had just come in so they stopped hand inking everything which was an absolute bankruptor of the studio they the Xerox machine, I think, saved Disney for another 20 years when they when they brought it in because they were just able to streamline the, the uh, cell painting process with it. But that created its own aesthetic. And another problem that we had at Bluth, because we used them as well, um, another problem with that was they never make a perfect copy. So there's always like a slight stretch on them. It's very frustrating. So when you would try to take something that was Xerox, like your cleanup drawing, and peg it up. Thankfully, this wasn't my job. And then peg it up to uh, the, the pegs to animate. They One side or the other would be slightly off. And again, if you, I'm going to ruin these old movies for you, but if you look at them really carefully, especially some of the Don Bluth stuff in the late 80s, early 90s, you will see jitters, um, especially with the live action reference stuff, any human animation. So they just kind of stand out once you know what to look for. But again, if you were to fake, like if somebody said we want to fake like a 1980s style uh, animation, we, then we have to put these jitters in, <laughs> uh, you know, whether we like them or not, because they that would be a giveaway when you're trying to forge something or make it look like it's absolutely from the time period. And uh, sometimes people are very good at that. The, the Cuphead game does a lot of that kind of thing too. Kudos to them for that level of detail, commitment, because it made a lot of work that they didn't have to do. It showed love, you know, when you start like making like little color errors that are deliberate. Okay, so I think they're good here. Uh, let me get rid of these. Let's see, remove keyframes. Great. So that little temporary, oh no, hang on. That got deleted there. Somehow that got deleted. So let me, there we go. Got to watch like a hog. It accidentally deleted my uh, drawing there. Oh, that looks pretty nice. So I'm kind of glad that I led the, the bad drawings in at the beginning. I'm really not happy with them. Like I wouldn't, if I got a cell set up and I got that or that, I wouldn't be happy. But let's go in right now. And one thing that we can do to try to do some damage limitation is, oh, is, um, what happened there? Drawing moved. 
little bit of a glitch in the program there is I can sort of open up some of these shapes. Don't close them off as much. And I'm going to just make this eraser a bit bigger. Oh yeah, and erase that nose. That's, that's already becoming a lot more forgiving. Same here. And we can certainly add an in-between, I think, from there to there. And this gap from here to here is quite big. So you could also put like an in-between in there if we feel that that's just moving too fast. But I think it actually it's all right. That's fine. And let's look at the hand. So that's a nice little touch. See, so you, we put like that little hand move there and it just gives it a little bit of extra. You can see the rest of the video on YouTube, the final 10 minutes. I tie down the character, do some fine tuning. And I also talk about some behind the scenes stuff from my time at Bluth, which I would rather not put on YouTube. Uh, just in case anybody gets embarrassed by it. So that's it. Uh, Patreon, if you want to snag the final 10 minutes, it is for members, unfortunately, but you've already seen the, the bulk and the bones of the uh, tie-down process anyway. And stay tuned. The next episode in the process of this scene will be tying down the hair. That's coming up real soon. Cheers, bye. I don't have a sponsor, so if you want to support my work and help it to continue, you can subscribe to my Patreon. I'm making new animation projects week by week and providing animation assets that can be downloaded and used. I also have a very large collection of tutorials in the LinkedIn Learning Library covering animation and design, and I'm putting all the links to these in the notes below.